Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Um, wonderful to be back to see so many familiar faces and uh, and so many not familiar faces too. And uh, look forward to catching up with you. I, I seem to have had a wonderful lunchtime catching up with a number of you out in the corridor till I've realised what I was missing inside. And um, look forward to catching up with many more of you now uh, this afternoon and tonight. I'm available here all afternoon and tonight. So please do catch me and uh, have a chat. And I'm going to try and race through in time. I would hate to be gonged off. Um, so I'm going to try and race through and, and have a couple time for a couple of questions at the end. Um, however, if I don't have do that, um, then um, I'm all very happy to be talked to later on this afternoon and, and uh, to benefit from everybody's wisdom, uh, which is what it's all about. So a little bit about the NFF. And one of the things that I think uh, has become very apparent to me is that Matt always said to me that uh, as agriculturalists, one of the things that we do is talk to each other too much. So we talk to each other, we talk to farmers, we talk to rural media, uh, we read rural media, and um, there's this disconnect that we all talk about so much um, at developing. And one of those things, I think, in the disconnect that's developed is a little bit about NFF. Um, we have quite a complicated representational structure in New South Wales in, in terms of advocacy. I know that you spent some time on that yesterday, talking about the peak bodies and the and NFF. And, um, and for those of us that live and breathe in this world, then uh, it does strike me quite often that a lot of people just don't understand how it works anymore and maybe this is something part of the challenge if we're going to initiate some change and make sure that we stay effective which is the challenge of all organisations that we stay effective um, and efficient and we do what we do as best as we possibly can we need to understand first of all how it works and where we come from hence in my job I get a lot of history lessons uh, which is always great love the history um, some of it I can do things about and some of it I can't and I like to start from a place of understanding where we've been and then and then planning and strategising about where we could go. So the NFF, um, one of the greatest history lessons I've had, and I love the story in New South Wales, the story that Milton Taylor and Michael Davidson used to tell me about how joining the pastoralists and, um, and the, the, the farmers and the graziers, joining the farmers and the graziers. And uh, I always thought what far-thinking, wonderful men they were that got around the table and decided to do that in New South Wales. At the national level, it also happened. And uh, back in 79, uh, I think nine organisations, all very strong, good organisations in their own right, decided that they needed to speak with one voice. They were better off speaking with one voice in the national arena if we were going to actually counter some of the wicked issues that were, um, were attracting attention back in those days. So... Um, that, and I actually was lucky enough to meet one of the Western Australian men that was a signatory to that first agreement not that long ago. So... That, <clears throat> that to me is an amazing history and that tenet stays true to me today. Uh, I do what I do because I'm very passionate about agriculture. I'm very passionate about agriculture having a, a sustainable, good, strong future. And to do that, I believe that we need a very strong, sustainable farmer's voice, speaking on behalf of farmers, speaking on behalf of agriculture and making sure that we can get good outcomes, not just in industry, but, but through politics as well. So... Um, we, the NFF brand is very strong. It's had its ups and its downs, I think, over the years. But I have to say uh, I'm very pleased and proud to say that in Canberra at the moment and, and across Australia, the NFF brand is strong. People know about the National Farmers Federation. People know about where we've been. Uh, they may have some understanding about where we're going, maybe not. Um, but um, certainly the NFF has got a very proud history and it's one that I'm, I'm very humbled and proud to be heading up now. 16 staff, so not a huge organisation, um, and we cover most states and most commodities. Uh, of course, we cover organisations like New South Wales Farmers, which covers a number of commodities itself. So through New South Wales Farmers, we cover um, commodities like horticulture, for example, which we don't actually have sitting at the table currently as a commodity member. And states like South Australia, which are not represented either at our table at the moment, although some of their members are members by virtue of them being in a peak body or in a state farming organisation somewhere else. So it's a little bit complicated. Um, at, at the moment, what we want to do is to try and get everybody around the agricultural table. So very, very... Um, strong, good conversations, continuing communication with um, commodities like horticulture. And also Tony and I have been down to South Australia and they've been up a number of times now, continuing on that conversation, uh, Northern Territory Farmers and of course Tasmania is the last one as well. So it's 
about speaking with the voice of agriculture, speaking with one voice, being able to go forward with a voice that is supported by all commodities and all farmers. And when we think of some of the wicked issues in front of us now, in these days, things such as uh, um, the, the, the bridging the gap with the consumers, the, the animal welfare issues, the uh, vegetation management, any of those sorts of trade issues, market labour market issues, any of those sorts of issues that we're dealing with now, um, productivity, profitability. It's incredibly important that we speak with one voice. Um, Derek, can you give me a little, a little ding when I get to like nearly getting towards the end and I'll just speed up, speed up, speed up. Righto. <coughs> just before you gong me off, can you give me warning? Righto. So the changing face of advocacy. Oh dear, my, something's happened to my little things, but we won't worry about them. They seem to have been compressed. I had such lovely little logos there too. Um, Advocacy is changing, and those of you that are familiar with GetUp, those of you who are familiar with change.org, um, will understand that now you can, you can amass millions of people at the touch of a button. And people have that expectation now. People expect now instantaneous results. And it's harder to get people involved in some of the organisations that we have. Look at local government, look at local service clubs. People are, are wanting to, to take, their, they're busy in their own lives and they see that, that by pushing a button, it's an easier way to go forward. This is the, remember, this is the rally, the big rally that everybody spoke of so many years ago where 45,000 farmers all got together in front of Parliament House. Would that happen again today? I mean, these days, some, you know, arguably, change.org, get up, those sorts of activist groups, they can, they can actually mass twice that many, three times that many people, 10 times that many people in, in, in the course of 24 hours online. And we've seen that those, those petitions, we've seen that those activist groups have actually had huge success with online advocacy, with e-advocacy. So how do we as farmers go on and what, what bearing does that have for organisations like the NFF? What we've done, and again, I'm sorry about the logos, it hasn't liked your computers at all. Um, what we've done is we're looking at the way we do things in NFF. Um, we are, so we are predominantly, and we are a member organisation. NFF is its members. We have 36 members sitting around the table, including the state farming organisations and the commodities. And traditionally, they've come together in members council. The members like New South Wales Farmers and the peak councils have actually put people on our committees and we look at issues through that way. How can we actually connect more with farmers? How can we be the people that can react quickly when they have issues? How can we be responsive when our members are actually the organisations and not the farmers? What we did was to set up a platform called Australian Farmers. And we launched it in July 2016. And it's, it's, it was sort of launched as a trial, really, to see how it, how it worked, whether it could be an interface from farmer to farmer and whether it could be an interface between farmers and consumers. Because what's missing often is that interface and that connectivity between the people who grow the food and the people who eat the food. There's a huge misunderstanding about uh, farming and farmers, and there's not a lot of places that people can go to actually get information about that. And we've used it as an e-platform to run some of the campaigns and issues that we've been talking about. There's a number of them there now. So we've talked about uh, the backpack attacks, the Defence Minister land grab, uh, save the write-off, stop the Ararat rate rot, campaign to end the data drought. We've run all these campaigns through the platform and we've actually found it to be immensely successful. All those e-advocacy campaigns are actually campaigns that we were able to win on behalf of farmers, uh, which is certainly an exciting opportunity. Why are we actually interested in this? What are we fighting for? It's because agriculture can be our next $100 billion industry. So over the last few years, we've seen amazing farm gate growth. It's been incredibly exciting. Um, and $100 billion, it's now 64.8, I think, at the last um, ABARES reports. $100 billion by 2030 is not out of the woods if we can get our act together, if we can get our policies together, if we can be sustainable, productive and profitable, then certainly $100 billion is not beyond our reach. Oops, I'll just go back one. That's a little, that's a little graph showing exactly just how much it has actually grown over those last few years. 
So NFF, where does it fit in? Certainly we have some policy priorities and I'll just tell you again that these priorities are priorities that come through our committees. We've just actually downsized our committees. We had 13 committees, which was a little bit um, A, expensive and B, difficult to operate. We've actually brought them down to six committees and a number of task forces that will be initiated as we go along to make sure that we can be agile and focus on the issues as they come along. Can you can read through those. One of them was digital infrastructure and uh, digital infrastructure connectivity, obviously an incredibly important issue in the bush at the moment. Bad connectivity is bad for business. There's a number of items now and, and business basics that we do online, as well as some of the exciting developments around productivity and profitability. So it's incredibly important that we get on top of this issue if we are actually going to make the most of what the digital world offers. That's a chart of all the different products that are out there online. It's an incredibly complicated space. Look how many there are. But the, the disappointing thing for, for, not disappointing, but it is disappointing, is that a lot of those um, pieces of software and products actually rely on good connectivity to function. So a lot of people in regional Australia at the moment are just not able to actually utilise those products because of the lack of connectivity that we have. So how did we do it? What we're focusing on at NFF is a different way of doing things. We're trying to make sure we can collaborate wherever we can to make our voice bigger wherever we can. So we formed a coalition. We formed a coalition with all these other groups. There's about 19 other groups. And some of them are our members and some of them aren't. And just as we uh, did during the Backpacker campaign, just as we did during the Defence Land Grab campaign, all of these organisations are now on board with the same principles. And what we said was that 2017, it's a bit of an audacious goal, but 2017 should become the year that ends the data drought and sees reliable connectivity. Will we achieve it? I don't know. There's been some exciting outcomes so far, but I don't know whether we're going to get there. All these organisations have now agreed to fight for these five key principles. A better uni a United service, universal service obligation, customer guarantee about the services that you're going to receive, open access mobile coverage, fairness for SkyMaster and capacity building to help us make the most of the services once we get that connectivity. How have we gone about lobbying for this important thing? First of all, we sell the message in the media. So we've put out the, the regular, you'll all be familiar with press releases, so we, we actually fight this through, through press releases initially. We also did, uh, uh, we spent some time on the Hill. Uh, a number of us, there's a group there in the middle that were the key group, went around and organised 52 meetings with members of parliament. So you can't just concentrate on the government. You can't just in, uh, concentrate on the coalition. You have to meet with all members of parliament, upper and lower house, to make sure that they understand the issue, because a lot of them don't. And lastly, online through our Australian Farmers platform. We have seen some significant change. Um, we've seen more data to be delivered, but even in the last few days, we've still had some, some concerns. We heard from Mick Keogh around the, the ACCC uh, roaming review. And I'm sorry, I am racing through this, but I'm, I'm determined to finish. 2017 is a pivotal year. There's a number of things that are happening in the, in the regulatory and legislative space. It's important that we were ready to actually come out with a united message to actually fight for the people in the bush and to fight for better connectivity, which will be so important. And uh, as you can read through that list, you'll see some of those uh, outcomes have already occurred, some of them are still underway. And the good thing is, is that as a coalition of uh, multiple organisations, then we can actually uh, be much stronger in our voice. Farmers are much stronger in their voice if they can actually seize, seize that coalition to work, to work across um, boundaries, sometimes at which we don't agree on, and have a concerted message. So we're seizing the moment. 2017 is the year we're going to make it happen. We have an audacious goal. We have a, a, collab a collaboration and a commitment, and this is the year that um, it's going to happen. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the way that it has to happen. Uh, as farmers, we can't just sit back and wait for things to happen for us. We need to have, we need to go to government with uh, what we want and how we want it to happen. We need to then have that supported through uh, uh, the community because if we don't have community support, then we're not going to have government support. So that is why we need a strong voice. That's why we need a New South Wales Farmers, a strong New South Wales Farmers, and that's why we need a strong NFF. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me back here today. It's been wonderful to be here. Look forward to talking to many of you over the afternoon.
Thank you, Fiona. It was agreed to take a couple of very quick questions. Was it was very good. So. No gonging on. Yes. Uh, Jim McDonald, yes. Great to hey, see Jim. you. Still got the passion, Fiona. That's fantastic. So you've got me on a good day, Jim. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, I didn't have a chance to catch Barnaby because he shot off earlier, but I think the question's still good for you. Uh, we've got agricultural councillors. Um, you know, to me, trade is pivotal to everything we do. That should be number one in what we do think. Act. <clears throat> uh, we've got agricultural councillors in the US, China and Japan, Middle East, Indonesia and EU. Uh, to me, Brexit gives us a great opportunity uh, to forge what has what used to be a good trade link, but has diminished with the EU. Uh, I would think it's probably appropriate that we push to go get agricultural councillors in there now as, so that they've got somewhere to contact rather than wait until we're too late. Because I know the buggers across the ditch, they'll be in there as quick as they can be. Absolutely right. Those, those people across the ditch, they're very quick, aren't they? No, great question. And look, um, great opportunity to, to hopefully, first of all, answer that. And I will take that on board. I'm not sure at what stage the councillors are appointed, whether it's after a trade agreement is reached or, or when it is. But certainly trade is something we need to take on. At the moment, with the wave of protectionism sweeping Australia, in the pubs, trade is a dirty word. Free trade agreements particularly are a dirty word. As farmers, it's really important that everybody understands that for us, they are our absolute lifeblood and bread and butter. Well, we produce so much food and fibre in Australia. We cannot eat it all. We cannot use it all. We export 70% of what we produce. That is what provides the markets for us as farmers in Australia. So if we don't have agreements, they need to be good for agriculture. Uh, they won't be... Every trade agreement won't be good for every single commodity. But we do see that uh, the EU and also um, the UK present some amazing opportunities. I attended an EU Leaders Forum just a couple of months ago where the EU is unashamedly gunning for our um, support and they see it as the EU versus the UK. Um, NFF has been able to get some, some actually some funding from the department to, to send a delegation to the EU where we will again unashamedly lobby for their business to make sure that we are in there very early uh, and telling them how wonderful our produce is and what we can do together. In terms of the Ag Council, the other interesting thing is, is that we're also lobbying for an Ag Councillor in Australia, a Trade Councillor in Australia, to start talking the talk. Across the ditch they have one and it's just an ordinary fellow that goes around and talks to people about about how good trade is. Now, we need to start selling that. As farmers, you need to be selling it in the pub. You need to be talking to your neighbours. You need to be talking to the community uh, about getting it right, making trade a win-win for everyone. So thank you very much. I will find out about when that council is appointed and I'll try and get them in there earlier if we can. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, just a quick question and Fiona, a quick answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Hazelwood, uh, Dundee. Um, how are you, Dennis? Barnaby reminded us this morning how much food has got to be produced in the next 50 years. When I graduated in agricultural science over 50 years ago, I was told the same thing. What people didn't say was that as a farmer, you will get an ever-diminishing proportion of the consumer's dollar that may even put you in impoverishment. And to you and to, what, and to Mick, what can you say to young people going into agriculture today with any degree of confidence that we can still re retain a, an adequate amount of the consumer dollar because despite our sophisticated organisations, the rapist retailers came in even just in recent years and with dollar a litre milk virtually destroyed an Australian industry. So what can the ACCC and you and all of our organisations do to guarantee a future, a financial future for people going into agriculture? Thanks, Mr Hazelwood. Um, an incredibly important question, um, obviously. And look, no easy answer to that one. Uh, everybody's got to eat. That's, that's to start with. Uh, everyone's got to eat. But also agriculture's changing. And our um, industry, I have to say, is changing rapidly too. We have an enormous amount of young people coming into our industry now. We have an enormous amount of technology, if we can get it right in our industry. We are again talking about value adding in our industry. Right now, we have the opportunity to pick up the phone, to talk to a consumer in China, to send that product to China the next day and to have that there. Now, that creates enormous opportunities, exciting opportunities for what we can do with our product. So 
those are the opportunities and they are why young people and, and product producers must keep coming into agriculture. We must change. Uh, we grow wheat for wheat's sake. We will always grow wheat because we always grow wheat's mentality. If that was one that was there in the past, we need to be market focused. We need to be consumer focused. We have the tools now with digital technology, if we can get that right, and other technologies to actually get that right. It's an exciting space to be in. Dollar-wise, if we can start operating a little bit further up the value chain, even one or two steps, then immediately we start collecting much more money from the consumer. If we can keep the trade agreements coming, then we keep the markets operating and we keep the supermarkets honest. So uh, as short as I can go, I have uh, a great hope for, for a really vibrant future for agriculture. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. And I think that's where we need to be looking. We need to be looking to the future and believing in a strong and prosperous future for our industry, which is the food and fibre industry.